unfortunately a series of events, including the pandemic, endangered our security and made it impossible to travel to Iraq as planned. Despite the cancellation, my interest in the region remains intact and I am eager to learn more about Heartland Alliance International's work today. So now I will hand it over to my friend and Heartland Alliance International's Executive Director, Sarita Sandershen. Sarita. And now um, I would like to um, introduce to you two other colleagues um, and we can talk about our work in Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan. And today we're gonna to be joined by our country director, Salah Barzinji, who's, um, who's been in Iraq for a while, and Scott Portman, who's our director for international programming. And let's start with a question, right, that helps set the context for our work. And Scott, let's begin with you. You've been working in Iraq since 2004, and under your leadership, can you tell us a little bit about what we have learned, right, in nearly two decades of work in the region? Well, we started in 2004, initially working in areas of expertise that we developed uh, in the United States. So we started working in torture treatment and prevention. Uh, and uh, the work that we started was very much based on the Marjorie Kohler Center's work in Chicago, uh, you know, providing comprehensive holistic services for survivors of torture, working also within the primary healthcare system. So we sort of combined our work, uh, a torture treatment center model, as well as uh, a, a paraprofessional training model. But, you know, Iraq has experienced so much trauma and violence over the last three, four decades that, um, you know, the, the work of, of combining justice and healing, which is so central to Heart, Heartland Alliance's work in, in the U.S., is equally, if not more, relevant in Iraq. So relatively quickly, we branched out into other areas as well. We began working in gender-based violence and human trafficking. Uh, we began working in child protection. Uh, and we worked uh, consistently over the years with internally displaced persons and refugees. Uh, and more recently, uh, particularly in the wake of the Islamic State conflict, we've done a lot of work with ethnic and religious minorities. Um, and in terms of what we've learned from our work in Iraq, uh, we'll talk a little bit later in this presentation about specific models. But I think Heartland Alliance has in some ways piloted this combination of working with legal professionals and social services and mental health professionals together. Um, and that's, again, it, 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 the, the work that we do in Iraq is somewhat similar to the work that the Marjorie Kohler Center and the National Immigrant Justice uh, Center does here in the United States. Um, and and in, some ways, in some ways different. Um, in Iraq, we, we work to strengthen local organizations and government systems where they exist and where we can strengthen them. Um, we also work throughout the country. I think one of the things that uh, is important uh, in Iraq is, you know, Iraq in some ways remains a divided country uh, mm -hmm. with strong regional identities right. and, and linguistic differences and cultural differences. So we, we, um, it's important for us to work throughout the country and we currently operate in, in Baghdad and Basra in the south, as well as in Kurdistan in the north, as well as in Mosul and Nineveh governorate, uh, uh, which was the area that was most affected by the Islamic State. Thank you, Scott, for um, you know, creating the landscape and also giving us a sense of uh, the areas of work. Salah, just over to you. I have um, a question regarding the populations that we serve, right, through this work that we do. Can you tell us a little bit more about the exact populations that we serve? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Sorita, for this chance. And welcome, colleague, to this event. I'm really happy and proud to be here with you. And thank you for your attention and interest to listen uh, to what we are doing in Iraq. Uh, we are serving the most vulnerable people in Iraq. Through our programs, we are providing direct support to the survivor of war, especially the survivor of ISIL war and other war in Iraq that happened in the past 10 years. At the same time, we are providing direct support to the survivor of torture and the survivor of human trafficking, the victim of trafficking as well as the juveniles that they have been recruited by the terrorist group, which we are trying to reintegrate them to their society through educational program and psychosocial support in addition to some livelihood support as well. More than this, we are working with the ethnic minorities in Iraq, especially at the Nenawa Plain, while most of the Iraqi minorities located there now. Either they are displaced to the Kurdistan region, uh, governorate, or 
they are work, they are they return back and they are living right now at the Nino plane. Mm -hmm. So in addition to this, also we are providing more support to the general IDPs and refugees that they are living in Iraq right now. We are providing direct legal support and psychosocial support uh, to the beneficiaries. So we have a very diverse program, as Scott mentioned. We have five uh, main bases, and we are working at 14 provinces right now. But most of our focus uh, uh, is to help the survivor of human rights and the survivor of genocides. Great, thank you. And um, just to build a little bit on uh, what Scott mentioned in terms of um, you know the work that we do with survivors of torture in, in Kovla, the issue around uh, mental health, right? At Heartland Alliance, we know that mental health is a critical element of building our overall health and resiliency. Salah, how, can you say a little bit about how our team helps the people that we are serving, right, uh, heal and grow? Uh, thank you, Surita. Well, unfortunately in Iraq, we have some critical problems and chronic uh, academic problem in providing psychosocial services. You have a very uh, few number of specialized clinical psychologists, psychiatrists that they're working at this field. So through our program, we built three centers right now in Iraq, one in Mosul under the name of the Smile of Hope and another two, one in Baghdad and Basra. Under the name of Irada, these centers, they are providing direct uh, trauma rehabilitation and trainings to the uh, specialists, to social workers, psychologists. Also, we are working with the Iraqi psychiatrists to build their capacity. The aim of these centers is to provide direct psychosocial services to the beneficiaries. And uh, also, we are providing other models of service to the ethnic minorities, to the juvenile justice in Iraq, that they are not accessing to the centers. We have special model for juveniles that they, are, they have been held in the prison for a long time. So we are helping them through a new model which is called Thrive to provide psychosocial uh, support through some physical activities and this kind of approach helping them to release their trauma and provide direct support to them. And um, you know, Salah, I understand that both you and Scott actually uh, visited a prison, right? Uh, where there were all of these young people. And so we're now supporting them. Can you say a little bit about that visit? Uh, yeah, actually we visited Talkir prison. Uh, we had like, very little access to that place, but after a human rights watch report, we encouraged Iraqi government to cooperate and to increase our access. So through this collaboration with the court of Mosul, we managed to visit the to visit the detention center of Tel Kiv. While we shocked actually, we, we saw the picture before we go there, but it was not as we was we saw by our eyes and what we feel there was really difficult uh, to, to believe. While there were more than 1,400 children in few rooms that they, even there were no space for them to sleep. They were shifting their, 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 their sleep. At the same time, the health condition was very bad. There were no any area to do any physical exercise. Most of them, all of them, they been separated from their families for a long time. There were no family visits. At the same time, they don't have access to lawyers. So they all been accused for a very serious and very difficult charges under the terror law in Iraq while the, the age category started from nine years old. Mm -hmm. So it was really heartbreaking to see these children living in this condition and do nothing. So we decided, and it's not about decision, it's about responsibility. This, this feeling that you see there will not let you go without doing, without doing everything for them. So we decided to start working at that uh, detention place. We secured our access. We provided lawyers and we get more support from UNICEF now to work directly with the, at least now we have 150 juvenile that we are reintegrating them to the society. Yeah, it's so, it was really heartbreaking uh, to hear the story and you think about, and you think about, you know, what's been happening in the U.S. with the separation of children um, at the border. So Scott, can you um, say a little bit about, and you know, people have asked this question, what makes HAI's uh, model, right, unique? 
um, because it's a model that we um, that we feel is key to our healing, and it's been replicated in Chicago and Iraq. Scott still on uh, mute. I think we have a technique. Oh, there we go. We got it. We got it now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just had to be unmuted for a second there. Yeah, sure. I, I'd love to talk about that. I wanted first, very briefly, to answer Mimi's uh, uh, Mimi's question about um, about what the children are being held on, and also just one small anecdote about our visit to that jail. These uh, these kids um, were arrested during the ISIL conflict, mm -hmm. and they were accused of membership in the Islamic State. But that can mean a lot of things. A lot of them just attended Quranic schools because they were hungry and because they were fed there. A lot of them were children who were related to older Islamic State fighters and rounded up at the same time. Uh, and some of them, yeah, frankly, some of them probably did participate in the Islamic State. So, you know, but there's a whole range here. And our position is that any person under the age of 18, particularly the young ones, really need a lawyer. Uh, you know, you, you, you just, you know, people need lawyers, you know, they, they simply need that. Um, and, uh, and, and then, um, they're, when they're released, they're released back into the community, provided it's safe. A lot of times there's risk of retribution from the community. We have to do contact tracing, family tracing, and very careful reintegration back into the society. But one other thing I wanted to say about this, when we left that prison, Salat turned to me and he said, did you notice how it was completely silent in there? You know, there's a thousand teenagers in, in six rooms um, and you didn't hear a sound. And, you know, I had noticed it and it sort of made gave me a shiver, made that kind of hair go back, go up on the back of my neck, because it's true. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't think of another circumstance where you could put, you know, 1,060 teenage boys and have complete silence. And it was clear that all of them had been tortured during interrogation and that, and that in fact, um, you know, physical punishment was ongoing. Uh, it was a rather chilling circumstance. So we've been doing our best to triage, to try to work with the youngest if we can, to make sure that people remain in contact with their families, and to make sure that when they get out, they're put back into situations where they're not going to be re-recruited and where their own communities aren't going to uh, uh, carry out retribution against them. But in terms of our model, and I, I want to be mindful of time, um, you know, when one is dealing with services for torture survivors, in Chicago, where there's a stream of asylum seekers coming in, uh, you know, and but the numbers are not huge, you can provide holistic services um, uh, for um, uh, through, a, through a, a treatment center that provides a wide range of high quality, uh, high um, sort of uh, high level services. Um, but in Iraq, um, you know, torture is so widespread that the only way to really effectively address it was through the primary healthcare system and through what's called task shifting, which is training paraprofessionals in mental health services. So in Iraq, we've actually done both. We established more than, we established in 2008, I believe, Iraq's first torture treatment center, which is now independent uh, and fully functioning uh, more than a decade later. And recently we've established torture treatment centers in Mosul, Basra, and Baghdad. It'll take a few years for those really to get up to speed. It's not a quick process. Um, so I think I will leave it there, be, uh, just being mindful of time. No, this is this is great, and I also like the fact that you know you were you were talking about you know the the young folks that you saw in the prison. I'm curious also, um, and I'm sure everybody else um, on this call is as well. Is how does um, our mental health and justice work actually? Um, you know, inter intersect. And I was going to let Scott answer that question. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, I muted myself again. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, it's it's an important issue. Um, I, I think one of the things that's innovative about our work in Iraq, it's, it's more standard now, a decade later or 15 years later uh, among many organizations. But when we first started in Iraq, it was somewhat unique to combine on teams, lawyers with social workers and mental health professionals. And we did that in the context of displaced persons also, and in the context of mobile teams and in the context of community services. And I think it's important, you know, um, people sometimes trust their lawyer, sometimes they trust their psychologist, sometimes they, they trust both, but they usually trust one or the other. And that sort of therapeutic dyad between a lawyer and a social worker is really important for getting trust, 
getting to the real story of what's actually going on and effectively providing services. Um, and so I, I think that that's been really useful and it's also been useful in helping um, victims of human rights abuses uh, address um, you know, justice issues for their perpetrators. Um, Salah, to his great credit, along with our lawyer Najad, managed to pursue uh, and assist in the prosecution of three police officers in Suleimania who committed torture and were in fact eventually convicted for that. Now we couldn't have done that without the combination of legal and mental health services, without a strong legal team, but without the, the, the victim of this being able to testify. Right. Um, and and so, so, um, so I, just moving on to Salah, right? Can you then say a little bit about, um, you know, the issue around transforming the legal systems to best respond to um, our work in the juvenile justice crisis? Well, thank you, Sorita, uh, Scott. Uh, well, the justice system, especially the juvenile justice system in Iraq, uh, need a lot of reform. Uh, until now, the age of criminal responsibility in the center and south of Iraq, starting from nine years old, which is, this is too low. While in Kurdistan region government, the age of criminal responsibility increased to 11. While we are advocating to increase the age of criminal responsibility at least to 12 years old. At the same time, uh, right now, the juveniles and children, uh, they are they've been interrogated at the same time they've been convicted based on the anti-terror law. Well, we have another system, we have the, the juvenile care law, and this is the, according to the Iraqi constitution, juvenile and children should be protected under that law. Also, they should be convicted under the same law. Well, the, now they are using this kind of measurement when they do conviction, but at the same time, the inter interrogation and uh, all the kind of uh, judgment will be based on the anti-terror law. For that, this requires a lot of effort from the international community and from us, how we can convince Iraqi parliament and the legislature to make some legal changes, uh, legislative changes to the Iraqi law that can be responsive to the CRC, the Child Rights Convention, at the same time to the international standards, which right now it's below the standards. At the same time, it's not only about the laws, also it's about the practice and the lack of services, the lack of alternatives for detention and the lack of staff sometime. For a city like Mosul, we only have one social worker to manage thousand cases. Mm -hmm. One social worker, I mean, from the juvenile court, we only have two judges to manage over a thousand of cases. And the situation in Baghdad is somehow the same, the situation in Kirkuk is somehow the same. So unfortunately, the, the legal team, they're under staff, they're under capacity. At the same time, we don't see a real alternative how we can protect those children from going to the jail for the long time. While there are other options according to the act effective juvenile care law, which is putting children under observation. And this is not the best option most of the time. I know sometimes there are some serious crime which requires serious action by the, by the courts. But at the same time, these kind of, of alternatives need to be uh, updated to the Iraqi uh, justice system. Thank you, Salah. And um, you know, as we wrap up, and we'll uh, we'll do the Q and A in a bit. I have one uh, last question, which is um, which has been asked of me before. You know, given that we've been working for over a decade, right, to prevent torture in Iraq um, and oh, to end torture in Iraq, and torture still exists. How has the human rights uh, culture in Iraq changed over the last 20 years? Uh, and Scott, you know, what difference has Heartland Alliance made, right, um, in that time? Well, thank you for that question. I, it is true that torture remains endemic in common in Iraq. Um, but, if, you know, over the years, we've developed uh, and, and support and capacity of a number of, of local organizations. For example, the DHRD, the Knights Development Organization, and they've been supporting the Bar Association. And so there is really a culture of human rights that is growing in Iraq. I mean, people have seen new ways of doing things. 
uh, you know, th there's so many incredibly courageous Iraqis. I, I recall going to the Bar Association in Baghdad and seeing an entire wall of names of lawyers who had been killed for doing their human rights work, for doing their, their duty as lawyers. Uh, and, you know, I, so I, I actually find it hopeful. You know, there are people, you know, the, the families of the disappeared uh, get together and, and, and petition the government for, for action. You know, uh, there's there's efforts to re you know for for the people of Mosul to come to terms with what's happened with the religious and ethnic minority communities, and you know, Iraq strikes me actually as a hopeful place in 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 a strange way, and, and there is a culture that's growing in the country that that deserves ongoing support. I think we've contributed a great deal to that over the years, um, and uh, it, partially also because so many of our own staff have gone on to Parliament. Or, or our own uh, team in Iraq is, is almost entirely Iraqis and have really grown in their human rights careers. So for that, I think Heartland Alliance should be very proud. Great, and we got to meet um, some of our team members in the beginning. So let's uh, move to doing the question and answer. And the first one uh, comes from Lynn, who wants to know who's providing our funding for our programs uh, and did the Trump administration impact our funding? And the and an additional question is, are we working with local organizations in our programs and which ones? So I'm gonna make sure that we do this right. I'm gonna have Scott answer the funding and the Trump administration. And then I'm gonna have Salah do the local organizations and who they are. Perfect. Well, our funding comes, actually our funding in Iraq is very diverse. A lot of it is US government funding from the US State Department and USAID. We also have support from the Canadian government, the government of the Netherlands, and we have a significant amount of funding from UNICEF and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So it's really, uh, and we previously had a large European Commission grant and we, can, we intend to continue working with the European Commission. So our funding is from multiple sources. It's not entirely US government funding. Uh, in terms of the Trump administration, you know, on a very high level, we just never knew whether the Trump administration was going to abandon the Iraqis and the Kurds and just do something sudden and crazy. So we just didn't, we didn't know what to expect. I think farther down at the mid levels of the State Department and because the State Department budget is controlled by Congress, it didn't actually have that big of an effect. Uh, and we're hopeful now with the new administration. We think that the Biden administration is going to continue a commitment to democracy and human rights in Iraq. And, and we, uh, we're glad that that's the case. That's great. And Salah, can you answer the question about uh, local organizations? And, and, do, um, and do we get um, you know, funding from, from the Kurdish government? Uh, thank you, Surita. Uh, we have a number of partners. Right now, we have over 12 local partners that we are working to implement the project. Sometimes we do direct implementation, but most of the time we prefer to, look, uh, to work with local actors in order to provide them capacity, build at the same time support, and also to get their support to implement these projects and to provide uh, service to beneficiaries. For working with minorities, we are working with the Iraqi Alliance for Minorities, AIM, and also with the partner Hammurabi organization at the Nenawa Plain. Also, we are working with Yazda in Sanjar. For our work for combating torture in Iraq and providing support to the war victims, we are working with also the International Handicap Organization and the Iraqi Alliance for Disabled Disability People. At the same time, we are working with the, uh, another international organization, the War, uh, the War Child UK. Uh, they are also part of this consortium that we are providing support to the war victims. In addition, we are working with other partners in Al Basra and the Basra City Al Taqwa organization that. We are providing support to the Iraqi women leadership and with the Women Leadership Association in Baghdad. And also we are working with the women, Mar'an uh, Namuzajia, with the women elite in uh, Samawa. And also we are working with the Democratic Human Rights Development Organization in Suleymaniyah and with the PDO, the People Development Organization in Suleymaniyah as well. Perfect. We are not receiving any fund from the Kurdish government or from, or from the Iraqi government. While also we are working with uh, some kind of official institutions like the Independent Human Rights Commission and uh, either in either the federal government or with the regional government. Also, we are working with the Iraqi bar associations and the Kurdish bar associations uh, and some other associations as well. Terrific. Thank you for that. 
Thank you for that question. Um, and here's a question from Jessica. She wants to know, right? Oh, she's, she's letting us know that there is a large Yazidi community in Nebraska, which is not far from Chicago. Is there an opportunity for Heartland Alliance to grow in the Midwest? Who did you want to answer that? Well, I actually, let me, let, let me start, right? Um, I, so for, for the communities that we're working with um, in countries uh, where we have a presence, right? We recognize that they don't operate in isolation. And given the way that the, the, the migration continues to grow and borders continue to dissolve, we recognize that we have expertise, right? That we are providing in country um, and also for immigrants that are coming to the US. Um, I think we have to assess whether what, you know, whether as an organization we can provide the necessary resources to the community um, in the US. There are other organizations, certainly local organizations who work directly with the community. Here's what we do do now. We maintain contacts, not only with local organizations in the country, but also uh, in the US. So I'm, I'm gonna say, right, we wouldn't just walk in to work with a community unless we're invited, but we are certainly engaged with organizations that are doing that directly. So let me have Scott and Salah uh, add to this. Well, I'll just add briefly that Yazda, our partner in Iraq, is actually very active in Omaha uh, or in Lincoln, Nebraska, where there are so many Yazidis. So they do exist in the US. We also, Heartland Alliance's domestic programs are connected to refugee resettlement consortiums and uh, also the uh, uh, National Network of Torture Treatment Centers. So there is already some information flow between programs that work in this area. That said, of course, we would be interested in exploring further if there's some way to help um, uh, um, provide more, more support uh, to, to Yazda in, in, uh, in, in Nebraska or to the Yazidi community in Nebraska. What we're especially hopeful for what we're especially hopeful for is that the U.S. Re refugee resettlement program was almost ended by the Trump administration. And the Biden administration has committed to reopening refugee admissions. Hopefully that will mean more Yazidis who are now stuck in Turkey or in Greece or in other countries will be able to come to the United States, among other refugees. Thank you. Um, Salah, this is a question for you. Can you speak about how um, the pandemic has impacted um, our work and the people that we serve? Uh, yeah, you know, at the beginning, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, while well, there were very strong uh, lockdown and uh, the access was difficult to the centers, the access was difficult to the camp. So it was really, uh, we faced a little difficult time to manage the situation and to access those people. But finally, through getting some permissions with a very strong health precautions, we managed to have some mobile teams and community focal points to provide services to those people that they were heavily affected by this pandemic, especially among the minority communities and among the displaced people. Some of our partners, they start uh, producing local masks while at the beginning, even getting masks was either very expensive or was not affordable and was not even existing in some areas. So those masks help, especially the elderly people uh, when they went, when they have to go to hospital or something. At the same time, uh, we coordinated through those community focal point to transfer the hotline number. So we provided psychosocial support and uh, other kind of support through this hotline numbers uh, to make sure that to reduce the social contact. But uh, right now, while we see the, the pandemic has less effect in Iraq and the school is about to open next week, so our team start going back to the field. We are shifting our team by, through this the, the, the daily work, but now we have better access to the communities and we are working day to day to provide more services. Great. So that was the last question um, that we had from the, um, from the audience. And I wanna thank the audience um, for asking us these penetrating questions. And let me now then pass it back to Mimi for the closing. Uh, Surita, excuse me, there's one question that I want to answer is in the chat. Oh, 
Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's from Lori. She's asking where do these children go when they are released if they don't have contact with their parents? Thank you, Lori. This is a very good question. In fact, we start with uh, we start with an assessment inside the detention to make sure that we do family tracing. Unfortunately, some of the children, they lost their families in the war. Uh, then we are trying to find caregivers, either among their families, grandparents, or maybe other relatives. So we do this assessment before the child release to make sure that they are not going to a street or they are not dumping them in a camp. Because also government, they have this option when those children release, they are sending them to a camp. In order to avoid that, we do this pre-assessment to make sure that they will reintegrate to their family members or to a caregiver at the end. And we ended up with a child that has no one due to the war, which unfortunately we had. Then we will work with the Department of Social Affairs to make sure this child will get a government uh, shelter, which is the orphanage house uh, for those children. Thank, Thank you, Sorita. Sir. No, no, thank you, Salah, for catching that question, which I missed. And now over to you, Mimi. Okay, thank you. And thank you to all of you for filling us in on what is happening in Iraq and the difficulties. But it sounds like you have made a lot of progress. And this is very heartening to hear. So we thank you, all of you, for tuning in. This work can only be done together with your help. That's why you will see a quiz pop up on the screen momentarily. So please let us know which country you want to uh, learn about next. If you would just take a minute and um, make a little check mark in the one that you're interested in. I'm going to make one here myself. <laughs> And then be sure to follow us on social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Goodbye, thank you, and stay well.